Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the summit on steering in the right direction, diversion and supports for transition age youth in the criminal justice system. This is the third panel um, of our three panel summit today. And the, the one that we're about ready to start is entitled Preparing Transition Age Youth for Successful Reentry in the Community. Um, excuse me. Um, our, uh, my name is Dr. Lisa Callahan, and I'll be the moderator for this summit today. Uh, I'll be the moderator for the summit. And um, I work at Policy Research Associates, which is the home of the SAMHSA Gaines Center. Um, the disclaimer I will need to read is the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for, Sub the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Sur Treatment, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So um, we are hope, hoping that this, today's presentation will generate some questions from you. And if you do have some, please put it in the Q&A pod, which you'll see at the, most of you, it'll be the bottom of your screen. Um, we, there's also a chat box, but we prefer that you put the questions in the Q&A if you could. That way, we, they'll be in, all in one place and easier for us to address. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll also um, be having a couple of polls. There's the first one that we're hoping that you will respond to, just so we get an idea of who's here, who's attending, what part of the country, uh, and what, what professions that you represent. Um, so we'll know who's in the audience today. So if you take a minute to do that, we would be appreciative. This, this webinar, as well as the, what, the two that have preceded this one, is being recorded, and the slides will be disseminated in the days following the webinar. Um, for your attendance at this webinar, um, a certificate of attendance will be available for you to download at the end of the webinar. This certificate is just for your personal portfolio. It's not for um, CEU credits. We have arranged for ASL interpretation services during this meeting, and the ASL interpreters are Lauren Burr and Kelly Land. Live transcription from Zoom is also available if you click transcript, live transcript CC, and then select show subtitle, uh, the sub and subtitles can be moved um, where you would like on the screen. Here's just a, um, a brief overview of what our agenda is going to be for to close out this afternoon. And um, so before we get started, I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone knows to use the Q&A pod if you have any questions, whether they're technology or substantive, and we'll address those as we can. So for this session, the first speaker is going to be Tamara Sorluz. She is the Chief Program Officer at UTEC Inc., which, um, which supports youth in Lawrence, Haver Haverhill, and Lowell, Massachusetts. She is a Peruvian immigrant who's worked with young adults for over 15 years. She began her career working for the New Bedford Juvenile Resource Center, a program that provides education services as an alternative to our incarceration to young people ages 13 to 17 as a young adult herself at the age of 19. This internship opportunity ignited a passion in Tamara for understanding the needs and challenges of systems involved youth, especially black and brown youth involved in the criminal justice system. She has a master's degree in social work from Boston University. And as a social worker and youth worker, her favorite value has always been assume goodness because the heart is always good and young people have always proved this to, to be true. Our second speaker is Kyle Magalenas Castilla, who serves as the co-executive director for Community Works, CW, a nonprofit in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it, its aim is to transform justice, both as it exists within systems and what can be done outside of the system. In this role, he oversees the agency's direct service programming and systems change efforts, the latter of which are centered on the lived experience and expertise of those participating. Prior to joining CW, Kyle worked as a legislative and regulatory advocate for a number of statewide membership-based organizations, as a legislative staffer in the California Assembly, and as a journalist covering electoral politics for so, so, several periodicals. Our third speaker is, is Lila Bihak Guterres, and she is the Associate Director of Restorative Reentry at Community Works in San Francisco. She is responsible for assisting her reentry colleagues in delivering uplifting services to our community and bring support 
resources and training to her team. She also cultivates strategic partnerships and provides a solution-oriented response to problem solving. Before coming to CW, Leela worked in international development in Latin America and Africa. She's also worked in assisting indigenous people on their journey to recovery, as well as managing a nonprofit organization providing healthy outlets to youth and the elderly in a disadvantaged neighborhood in Montreal, Canada. So just a brief overview of, of who responded to the poll this afternoon. About 61% of our, of our fellow participants um, are from urban areas, about 20% from rural and 18% from suburban areas. Three people who are in attendance today reported that they live either on tribal lands, such as res a reservation, a Pueblo, or an Alaska Native village. And in terms of the professional agency or organization that um, most closely describes where you work, about 34% of the uh, people on the webinar today reported that they work for a community-based provider, about 22% for probation, parole, or corrections, and about 20% work for a government or policy entity. So with that, I'm going to turn the first presentation over, uh, over to Tamara, and then each of the presenters will follow. And um, I want to remind you, if you have questions, please put them in the the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, Tamara Soralus here from Utech Inc. Uh, and we're located in the Merrimack Valley in Massachusetts. Um, I, uh, Utech is a nonprofit a youth organization that serves emerging proven risk young adults. And what that means for us is that we serve the highest uh, risk youth. So youth that are either involved in the majority of the violence in the cities that we serve, are known to police, um, and or have um, a criminal justice record that is preventing them from um, and removing barriers uh, to access success. So I wanted to give everybody a little bit of the history of UTEC and how we came about because it is so integral to the values that still drive the organization today. Uh, so UTEC was a response by young people in the city of Lowell, Massachusetts in connection in reaction to gang violence here between Southeast Asian and Latino um, young adults. And the really the original vision for UTEC was to create a safe space for uh, high school students to be and stay out of the violence that was happening at the time in the community. And so we really opened our doors as a very informal drop-in center. Uh, we opened up in an old church. We said, uh, everybody come in as you will. And what we then noticed is that we had anywhere from 100 to 120 uh, young adults varying from age 13 through 25 walk through our doors. And so we really began to work with the city of Lowell at the time to identify if there's such a high need for this, how can we really make this something that is sustainable and permanent? Um, and so at the time, uh, we were slowly trying to also build relationships with the police departments because we uh, were beginning to build relationships with these really uh, young adults that were causing some of the violence in the community and wanted to work with them to support them um, and really began to work with the city and were eventually uh, received a small grant of $40,000 to start a, um, to rent a space where we began to provide after school activities that were a bit more structured. Um, and as you can see, we began this grassworks work all done by young people um, in 2004. In 2006, we actually hired our first mental health clinician in a partnership with a local mental health organization uh, here in Massachusetts called VINFIN, um, because we realized early on that there was a need uh, for young people to have access to mental health and that they weren't doing so in traditional models. Go to the next slide. Um, so throughout uh, kind of the early uh, 2000s and into 2010 and 18, we started to identify more and more needs of our young adults. So we started to understand that actually the population that we were really going uh, to serve was youth ages 17 through 25. Um, and there were a couple reasons for that. Um, there were less services being available to those that emerging young adult population um, because they were out of school youth. And so there was less resources for for them, the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA's were no longer catering uh, to, their, to their needs. Um, 
And so we really wanted a space that was theirs. And so we began to really talk about what that would look like. We started a workforce program through our first uh, social enterprise because young people told us that the number one need that they had was gainful employment. Uh, we began a mattress recycling program in 2019 that still is um, ongoing right now. And it provided us a space where we could put young people to work um, and their criminal records were not quite um, as necessary at the time. Um, and then Fast forwarding to now, uh, we really have expanded to a child care center. Uh, we now have expanded services to uh, pre-release. So we are in three uh, county jails here in Massachusetts where we meet young people where they're at. We try and build relationships um, and have expanded mental health services to in uh, right now we have a full mental health team of three clinicians fully funded by the organization and that is something that has been really important to us to not be tied to some um, models or traditional ways of providing mental health that doesn't quite work for young adults um, that creates barriers for young people to access mental health um, so that is where we are right now and um, just to talk a little bit more about the UTEC programming model. Um, so we have a very strong uh, community-based and community-responsive uh, street work program that really is supporting all of our young people to reduce risk-taking. And that may mean um, staying away from trouble, um, that may mean um, staying away from jail, uh, and really they're working with young people where they're at. A street worker can work with a young adult for one to three years, or sometimes for five or 10. Um, but those young adults that do become ready to engage in our program then will enter our workforce program, which starts with transformational beginnings. We do not expect every young person to join our program. Um, we actually only have capacity for about 50 young adults in our workforce program, so we know that the majority of them will be served just through the street work program, and our street workers serve anywhere from two to 300 youth a year. Um, our workforce program is still really rooted in social enterprises. We now have three. We have two vocational paths. We have a culinary, we have a cafe, we have a wood shop, um, and the mattress recycling is also still um, around, and we utilize that space to teach young adults workforce skills. We also added a high set program because young people are letting us know that uh, getting a high school diploma or an equivalent was really important to them. Um, and that high set program really focuses on getting young adults to attain their high set. Um, and we also then have a program that is specifically created to support them in their transition out of UTEC. We know UTEC is not a forever program. Most of our young people are in the program about two to three years. Um, some will only be here one, and they most likely will take breaks from the program. We actually expect that young people don't move through this program model in a linear way because of the challenges that may present themselves, including housing, substance use, um, reincarceration at times, that they will have disruptions and we welcome them whenever they are ready to come back and that is a really big part of our program is that we never shut the doors and we never tell a young person that they can't come back even if they need a break somewhere in this path and so we understand that this is not a linear path for them. Um, and it's just a little bit more about our in-reach work, um, but really this is a lot of the partnership work with police. We currently have partnerships with all the police departments of our three cities, specifically the gang units in all three cities. We meet with all three cities um, every week uh, to just understand what young adults really are needing more support, who's on the radar, who can would prevent from getting into further trouble, um, who is causing um, potentially some issues and how we can support that. Um, and just to, uh, you know, discuss a little bit of our mental health approach, uh, which I think is very unique here. So um, as an MSW and an LCSW, I was very much trained in a traditional um, therapy models, right, of CBT short term. And really what we do here is that our clinicians are first and foremost youth workers, and we see ourselves in that way first. And this allows us to really build relationships with young people that are informal and formal, but are um, less, that are not always just about their mental health so that we can really arrive at that trust stage where they can actually share with us what their mental health challenges are. So for us, our work is really to build relationships. And we very much see that and remove those barriers. Our young people don't have to go through billing to meet our clinicians. They can come and see us as often or as much as they need to. Um, and we are here on site all the time. And we are also now uh, assessing young adults prior to them entering the program to make sure that we have a full picture of their mental health needs. 
Um, and then another really important value um, here is that we see crisis as an opportunity. So whether it's incarceration, whether it's a mental health crisis, that, that is an opportunity for us to reach young people. Um, and one of the ways in which we do that a lot, which I know is not traditional, is actually through social media. We have been able to prevent a lot of mental health crisis um, through that process. And it is something that we navigate in terms of boundaries uh, very closely, but we have seen uh, a lot more young people being able to share their state and their mental health um, and where they're at in, during, in social media. And so we're currently monitoring that all the time um, and really supporting our youth facing staff and being trauma informed, understanding mental health first aid and getting them trained in mental health first aid and um, Narcan training, because we do have of young adults that uh, struggle with uh, staying sober. Um, and so these are some of the ways in which we support the whole program. Um, and last uh, but not least, we definitely face a lot of, you know, dilemmas and barriers um, that can be uh, challenging. We're still continuing to grow our expertise in substance use and understanding how to navigate young adults with sobriety, um, especially young adults who are on probation, they're court involved, and there's many times probation requirements connected to sobriety that are really challenging for them to navigate, um, especially also housing stability and how we can make some mental health, underlying mental health issues worse, right? We know that trauma can exacerbate some of these things. Um, and then working with young adults on healthy relationships with their partners that we see often um, in terms of, right, we know that our young people are engaging in violence and sometimes that can triple over to their uh, personal and romantic relationships. And we really want to support them in that. And also now uh, supporting our staff who are crisis focused, youth facing and how to support their mental health through benefits, through workforce uh, trainings, um, and through really wellness initiatives at our organization to make sure that our youth facing staff are also taken care of. Um, and I believe I'm handing it off to Kyle. Thank you. Um, just checking really quick that we have control of the slides. Perfect. So uh, hello, everyone. I know this isn't the type of presentation, given the, the sheer volume of, of attendees we have today, where there's going to be a lot of back and forth. And I'm certainly not going to ask everyone how they're doing and say anything about, like, I can't hear you. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to be able to be here today alongside a colleague of mine to tell you a little bit about the work that we do. Um, first of all, my name is Kyle Magallanes Castillo. I use he, him pronouns. I serve as one of the two co-executive directors at Community Works. On our next slide, we'll tell you a little bit about what Community Works is and the work that we do, but I'm also joined by my colleague here, who will introduce herself. Hi, thank you, Kyle. Hi, my name is Leila Bija Gutierrez. I go by, I use the pronouns uh, she, her, um, ella, and I am Associate Director of Restorative Reentry here at Community Works in the Bay Area. Thanks, Leila. Um, so I have no idea if any of the 300 or so attendees we have here today have ever heard of Leila or myself or of our organization, Community Works, but if you haven't, we wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do and who we are. There's some information here on our slides and you can view them here and you'll also have them in your packages afterwards. Um, one of the first things I'll say or note is that you may notice I am indoors and yet wearing a raincoat. So it's storming in California in the Bay Area and I work for a small, small nonprofit with a leaky roof, so anything can happen. Um, and that's really <laughs> uh, thematically interesting for our presentation today because as, as a small service provider and I see that a good portion of our attendees here uh, today are also working as service providers, you all probably understand what it means to do more with less. And so we've certainly done that for a good long time here at Community Works. So in terms of an introduction to our agency, Community Works has been around for just over 25 years now in the San Francisco Bay Area. We provide services for people kind of anywhere along the spectrum of justice system involvement. And so on the front end of things, that can mean people who are not in formal ways connected with justice systems, but may tangentially be connected. So they could be survivors of harm, but have, who have not gone through legal cases. They can be the loved ones of people who are currently wrapped up in the system, whether incarcerated or otherwise. Or they can be people who have different types of investments or impacts that are related to these systems, but again, not directly involve themselves. And then when we move down that spectrum, we also, of course, work with people who are currently in custody in both jail and prison facilities. 
And then finally, further down that spectrum, we work with people once they've exited jails and prisons and once they have come home to their communities and looked to reestablish roots and get onto paths for success. And that's a bit of what we'll be talking to you about here today, specifically as it pertains to our justice-involved transitional age youth. Um, I mentioned we're from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, specifically, for those of you who are familiar with the region, we work in three counties in this area, so San Francisco County, Alameda County, and Contra Costa County. And that's where all of our work takes place, and those direct services span all those different entry points or intersections with justice systems, but what we're talking about today most will be our reentry work. Uh, next, I'm going to pass it off to Layla, who's going to talk a little bit about what some of you may know in terms of what it means to serve this population specifically and what they face. Thank you, Kyle. Do I have control over the slides? There you go. Okay, that is not where we're going. That's a little too far, too further ahead. Okay, so first of all, when addressing justice-involved pay, transitional age youth, uh, we cannot forget about the history of racism and historical trauma that inflicts black and brown communities in the U.S. This system, this systematic oppression, more frequently than we're aware of, expresses itself in the form of intergenerational trauma. Researchers have found evidence that trauma can be passed between generations epigenetically, which means that trauma experienced by an ancestor might have might affect the way your genes are expressed, let alone the abuse and chronic stress that our youth experience in their developing years. Given that most justice-involved Tay come from disenfranchised communities, they are automatically put at a disadvantage with regards to health in general, um, and that, as you know, includes mental health. It is no surprise that 70% of justice-involved Tay have a mental health disorder and that two-thirds of them have a co-occurring disorder, meaning that they also have substance abuse problems, which, as we know, is most frequently than not a way to self-medicate, self-regulate, and cope with trauma. Another important fact to be aware of when working with Tay is that confinement leads to more recidivism over community-based services, such as restorative justice. And at an even higher rate, if they are incarcerated in an adult in an adult faced focused facility, we are now seeing that youth focused facilities are empty, and that they are systematically put in adult facilities, which drastically decreases their chances at ending this cycle of harm. For all these reasons, we at Community Works, and in general. When working with Tay, need to provide a trauma-informed container for behavior modification and healing at large. We believe that lived experience is extremely valuable for Tay to be able to relate and identify with their care providers, which significantly increases one's chances at building trust and developing a long-lasting relationship. And it works. A lot of the youth our team works with, we will remain in contact long after our work is over, per se. So how does our work with Tay look like? Whether we're working with young women or young men, we do our best to engage with them long before the release date. In general, we aim for six months pre-release. During that period of time, our work consists mostly of intensive case management and coaching. This means that we utilize this time to build a trustworthy relationship, to work on mindset and on developing an exit and re-entry plan, re plan that significantly increases their likelihood of succeeding. Once they are released, we then continue working with them in an ongoing capacity. We assist them in developing a healthy support system on securing stable housing and on furthering, either furthering their education and or lending a sustainable job. One of the outlets we strongly believe in lays in the empowering aspect performance art has on overcoming, overcoming trauma and regaining a sense of aid invited to attend restorative circles, which are proven beneficial in providing peer-to-peer -peer support. And I'll hand it over to Kyle to discuss some of the challenges we face with serving Tay. 
Thanks, Leila. You're welcome. Um, just to add on a little bit more too about in terms of our services there, Layla was saying there at the end that some of the work that we do has to do with the arts and we'll talk about some of the innovations to our work because in terms of our description of our model, in, we provide really standard reentry case management. So for any of you who are already working as reentry service providers or as TAY reentry service providers, you'll recognize some best practices in terms of when we're doing inReach, when we're connecting initially with clients, when we're starting to develop rapport, how we're assessing needs, how we're establishing goals in our case, and hopefully in most people's cases, using something like a smart goal framework. Um, all of these things are, are likely familiar elements to what are best practices for case management. And in addition to those elements, we, we have some complementary pieces that have to do with the roots of our organization. The roots of our organization are in restorative justice and in the arts. And so we'll again talk a little bit more specifically about how that manifests in our work with Tay on a later slide, but I just want to highlight that uh, mostly as a reminder to me to mention it to all of you when we get to that part of the presentation. But in the meantime, we do want to talk a little bit about challenges here. Um, we see some challenges that are listed on our slide. I want to make sure to emphasize that these challenges have been greatly exacerbated by the pandemic and are challenges, challenges that certainly persisted even before the pandemic. Um, so some of the challenges that we see come into the way we've categorized them here is about the challenges that in some ways are inherent to our target population to begin with and some of the challenges that uh, we encounter when working with system partners. And when we say system partners, we mean uh, sheriff's offices or probation departments or our California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, different uh, colleagues of ours who have the responsibility of administering services um, on behalf of the system in different settings, especially carceral settings. So in terms of challenges that we see with justice involved Tay specifically, even before getting into this, this bulleted list, one of the key challenges, again, for those of you who are already familiar with this population, is that Tay exists in a very interesting and unique space for us societally, right? They are legally adults and they come with the societal expectations that all of us have of people who are adults. And yet they often are paired with much less resources and much less capacity than you would expect from the from, from adults and actually more akin to what you would expect from adolescents. And so by living in this liminal space, a lot of tension points can exist for any transitional age youth, let alone a justice involved transitional age youth. And of course, the part that is really key when it comes to justice involvement means that being legally adult, legally an adult means that you are subject to the jurisdiction of our adult criminal justice system that has a different set of, once again, societal expectations for you and ways to um, implement accountability with you than perhaps with adolescents. So that's a key challenge as it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, working with this population, some of you may recognize that one of the um, main focuses that providers like ourselves invest in is building rapport. That's true of any two strangers and in any system-based kind of service provision. You need to build rapport and build trust with someone. But with Tay specifically, because they have so many qualities um, that exist amongst adolescents, such as some natural distrust and isolation and um, and impulsivity and judgment issues and belief in one like confidence and belief in one's own kind of judgment and decision making. These are things that we need to break past with rapport building and things that have also been so much more difficult in the pandemic, either because of physical restrictions that have just meant we cannot connect with Tay the way we wanted to as carceral facilities early in the pandemic shut off any visiting um, for safety reasons, but also because the pandemic has exacerbated issues of so social isolation and interpersonal interaction to begin with. I'm also going to warn all of you that the office I'm in right now is right next to some train tracks. And so we have a train coming by now. And there's no way to avoid it. We don't have other spaces here. So happy to talk to you and sorry for the train. Um, so, so there are just several issues working with Tay in general. Oh, wow. I'm surprised because I can always hear it. <laughs> but uh, I some of the issues that we encounter with Tay in the pandemic and before the pandemic have to do with mental health support. Mental health support is particularly needed post-pandemic or, or in this 
uh, latter stage of the pandemic that we find ourselves in because they have been isolated the way many people have been isolated from connections that they have otherwise had. And when it comes to justice involved Tay and the Tay that we work with, we're seeing that family connections have deteriorated significantly and connections with other loved ones have deteriorated significantly so that these Tay don't have the traditional safety net supports that they usually have amongst other people. Um, and so the need for accessible mental health services is really important. And aside from just the accessibility of them, the, the need for us to continue to build rapport with clients so that we can ensure and encourage that they access mental health services in the first place and push past some of the stigma that comes with struggling with one's mental health is also really crucial. I've also mentioned a bit about the isolation due to the pandemic, but this third challenge here around Tay has to do with housing options. Housing options are a challenge period, especially for the geography that we live in. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that the San Francisco Bay Area is one of the most expensive places in the world to live for people, period. When it comes to young people, uh, young adults who are not deep in or have not yet even begun their careers and have not begun to earn money at uh, the rate that they may in later stages of their life, that can be challenging. And then again, for young adults who are in that career point and have just exited jail or prison, it's even more challenging because for formerly incarcerated people, there are a variety of barriers to finding sustainable employment after a period of incarceration. And so due to those challenges, it can be really difficult, again, to find stable housing. And uh, finding stable housing is, a, is again, a, a key need for so many different populations, and it's no surprise then that it is for this population as well. I've mentioned a bit about family reunification there, too, so I'm not going to repeat myself. But segueing a bit to some of the challenges we see with system partners, again, some of these existed prior to the pandemic, but with the pandemic, they've persisted even further. And so one is that we're seeing not only less access to our clients to begin with, because there have been safety-based restrictions on how visiting can happen in the carceral facilities that we work in. And even as some of those restrictions lift, there are still miscommunications and not the same level of seamless coordination that we usually aspire to, certainly pre-pandemic, with these system partners. And so what that means for our Tay is that sometimes not even sometimes, unfortunately, oftentimes, what our case managers are encountering are transitional age youth they are already connected with, already know, have already assessed the needs of, and have begun to build out a plan for what happens once they come out of their carceral facilities, are being released without any prior knowledge in some cases, or at least not with enough um, advance notice to our staff to be able to connect with these Tay the moment they are released from these facilities. Mm -hmm. So that in and itself is already a challenge because we've built up all this rapport, all this trust, and some of it goes out the door this moment when someone is released back into the community without all the support that they said or that they heard that they were going to get from our staff. Um, and so that, that damages our ability to deliver services. But in addition to not just having the communication tight about when someone's being released, there is also releases that are happening that mean Tay, who are again struggling with their mental health and or struggling with different substance use disorders, are being put back into situations that exacerbate those issues and can be really dangerous, frankly, for these transitional age youth. And so without our staff to have a really warm handoff upon the moment of release, we, we end up taking many steps backwards in our ability to, to help these clients be on a path to success. Mm -hmm. um, a really specific issue that we've been finding, again, we talked a bit about housing, but specifically for the young mothers in our programs, we, we mentioned that we have two different gender responsive programs. For those, for the program, um, where we have young mothers, we're finding that both in terms of housing and in terms of inpatient treatment facilities, I'm sure this is no surprise to others because I think this is a problem nationwide, but there are so many restrictions for young mothers. And even in situations where our clients who are young mothers are able to be eligible for these programs and have their children with them, that is usually restricted in some form or fashion, whether it's a restriction or cap on the age of the children that are allowed to be with them, or if it's a restriction in terms of how long or how frequently their children can be with them. And then finally, we have gender responsive programming, and yet there is not the level of gender affirmation we would hope to see in partnering with some of our sheriff's offices, probation departments, and Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. 
And that can create some confusion for our clients when they see and experience one thing as it relates to this respect or disrespect for their gender identity in one setting. And then upon release, they have a different experience with that with us. And we want to be able to have this and all experiences for our clients be really consistent because that consistency is key to helping them again, be on that path to success. Um, Next, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about, well, in fact, I'm only gonna mention it very briefly because it's a bit off topic, but for those of you who have been all day on this webinar, you may have remembered, I believe from panel one, discussions around diversion. The reason I have a slide here on diversion for us is because as I said at the top of this, Community Works does lots of things and we have programs across the spectrum of justice and involvement. The reason it's relevant here is because one of the solutions we've found and one of the things that have been most effective to serving justice involved Tay is to prevent their justice involvement to begin with. Not groundbreaking stuff here, not genius level stuff here, and yet something that's worth mentioning. So we, among our other programs, run a pre-charge restorative justice diversion program for juveniles and Tay. And so this is after arrest, but before charges have been filed. And if charges would have been filed, the types of situations and harm that we're addressing are felony level cases. And so this is serious harm before a charge has been filed. And we work on a multi-month process between the person or people who have been harmed, as well as the young people who are responsible for causing that harm, to prepare them separately and in parallel to eventually come face to face and have a several hours long conference with one another about accountability, healing, and making amends for the harm that was done. We've seen extraordinary success in this program. And again, it's not directly relevant to the presentation today, so I'm gonna stop right there. But just to say programs like this, and hopefully like the diversion programs you heard about, or some of you heard about in panel one today, this is where the investment is going to be most useful, right? The work that our case managers are doing once a day is coming out of jail or prison is work that has mixed results at the best of times, to be completely honest, and is work that we could spend more energy on doing um, on the prevention side of things. In terms of other innovative approaches, we have we have a guaranteed income program that has uh, is in its second cohort. So last year we launched an initial pilot cohort. This year we have a second cohort. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with guaranteed income, it, it is kind of what it sounds like it is, right? So it's money that a person receives on a regular, consistent basis that they are guaranteed to receive, and it is no strings attached. Um, this is innovative, and also, understandably, we've seen skepticism from some people about the efficacy of an approach like this. So with our guaranteed income program, formerly incarcerated people who are already clients of our programs including the Tay that we're talking to you here about today, receive on a monthly basis this guaranteed income to do with as they choose. What we found in our first cohort from voluntary surveys about how people are using the money, they're using their money for survival-oriented needs. And this is really crucial because all of the growth work that we want to do with our clients is not growth work we can ever really get to when people are stuck and muddled by these survival oriented needs. Do I have a job? Do I have housing? Do I have food? Do I have anyone I care about who cares about me in my life? Some of those needs can be addressed simply with cash. And that's what we're finding um, with our guaranteed income program so far. And so we continue to use it as a supplement and complement to the case management and restorative justice group work we do with Tay. There's another component to this guaranteed income work that Layla will talk to you about now. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so at Camille Works, we believe in the holistic approach to reentry and healing at large. We not only want our returning citizens to survive, but rather to thrive in life. We have launched an economic, economic wellness initiative that aims to educate people on how to carve a practical path to economic stability. And this starts with financial literacy as a way to understand and own one's finances. We also strongly believe in entrepreneurship, in particular with system impacted people. That hustle mentality with proper guidance can be a powerful driving force to build a successful business. Given that we are in the Silicon Valley, this is a great opportunity to leverage the startup culture and its resources to benefit our returning people. Another unique opportunity to our geographic location is the abundance of tech trainings and jobs. 
We believe this is another sustainable option to land better paying positions and maintain long-term employment with opportunities for growth. Lastly, home ownership can seem daunting, yet there are programs and pathways available to disenfranchised people to own their homes, and we aim to build that bridge. I'll hand it over um, to Kyle again. Thanks, Leila. So uh, this is our, I believe, our penultimate slide, but it talks about a few different other innovative approaches we have um, that we'd love to talk with people about if any of these things seem particularly interesting to you, and maybe we can find time um, to sidebar about this at another time. Some of these we've touched on already, but I want to highlight a few things. So one component of our model in terms of doing reentry case management work, whether it's with young people or whether it's with older adults or anyone in between, is that the vast majority of our staff have shared or similar lived experiences. And so the vast majority of our staff throughout the organization are formerly incarcerated, but particularly in our reentry work, working with formerly incarcerated people, the vast majority of our staff are formerly incarcerated. And in some cases in the same facilities that our clients find themselves exiting from right now. And for those of you who run these types of uh, credible messenger or peer-based programs, then you may already understand the kind of value that comes with being able to break through the initial barrier to rapport building by saying to a person, look, I may not know exactly what you're going through in this moment, but here are some of my, at the very least, similar experiences that give me some insight that I'd like to share with you if you're open to it. And coming with both that level of connection, but also humility, we found to be really um, successful. Uh, we've mentioned that we have partnerships with a variety of system partners that have been really key for us, not only for access to clients, again, pre-release, but also in terms of continuing to resource and service them post-release. Um, similarly, we really want to and continue to collaborate with a variety of other nonprofits like ourselves. We offer in-house reentry case management and system navigation support for service connection purposes. We are not, though, for example, offering we're not a housing provider. We are not a substance use uh, disorder provider. We don't offer some services in-house. And so it's really important then to be able to meet the variety of needs that come up amongst our clients to have strong connections with colleagues and other organizations, some of which are just down the street from where I'm sitting now and others of which are throughout the Bay Area, because we never know, we being the broad we of service providers in general, we never know which client is going to connect with which of our staff people. Right? We don't know who is going to be able to get through to someone who is who someone is going to be willing to listen to and hear from. And so when we find those breakthroughs in terms of relationship building and rapport building, we want to make sure that when we're doing handoffs to colleagues who are providing other services that that same client needs, that we can know we're not sending that client into a situation where all of the goodwill we built up is going to go down the drain because suddenly they've gotten used to working with someone like ourselves who talks to them and trusts them and has a relationship with them one way. And then suddenly we're connecting with them with someone who treats them in a different way. Um, I also mentioned the restorative roots of our organization, been around for over 25 years now, beginning with the very first restorative justice program in a county jail in the entire nation. Um, happy to talk to you more about that program at another time, but the point is restorative justice uh, continues to exist in subtle and explicit ways throughout all of our programming. When it comes to our reentry work and our reentry work with transitional age youth, um, our restorative circles are uh, really key to building a safe, trusted space for peers with lived experiences to talk to one another. So despite the fact that our staff also happen to be formally incarcerated, having these young people who are getting out of these jails and prisons sit in spaces with other young people who are getting out of these jails and prisons and talking about the stigma of their car incarceration, talking about the barriers they're encountering post-incarceration is really important to fight against some of the isolation that we saw pre-pandemic and that we certainly see much more now during the pandemic. Finally, we also engage in a variety of arts-based programming. Those can be really across the gamut, right? We do different types of writing things. Uh, one of the things on an earlier slide that Layla mentioned is our Women Rising program has a sub-program called Rising Voices where the clients in that program uh, spend time writing a, a theater piece about their experience with incarceration and some of the things that led up to their latest stint of incarceration, and then they perform that piece on stage. Um, 
some of the other arts work that we do has to do with uh, creating murals or creating different types of physical art. And we found that those outlets have been really successful for people who have different learning styles, but also different communication styles in expressing what is already such a difficult thing to express, which is the shame and stigma that comes with having made a variety of mistakes and being incarcerated. Um, the way we're going to wrap up our presentation here is Layla and I are going to talk about this last slide in terms of what are we trying to do next and how can we rely on some learned lessons and iterate further. So Layla, why don't you kick us off with our, our first bullet here? Sounds good. Um, so some of the aspirations that we have for the future um, are to offer additional in-house supportive services that stretch beyond intensive case management. We believe that there are so many avenues that we can that we can take to improve um, our assistance to returning citizens. Um, and, and so that's, that's one of our aspirations. Another is, uh, I know we've talked a little bit about the guaranteed income support that we provide, but we also want to establish and sustain a pot of money that is specifically about permanent housing, because as much as there's been housing crises nationwide and certainly in the Bay Area here in San Francisco Bay Area, um, we also find that even when we are able to connect people with housing, short-term housing is a short-term solution. And so having long-term permanent housing for anyone, including formerly incarcerated or justice-involved people, is really key. And like anyone else who is seeking long-term permanent housing, there are a variety of costs that come with that, whether we're talking about security deposits or down payments or even resourcing the apartment itself with different types of furniture. All of that adds up, and those are costs that can really... Uh, intimidate people. And uh, we don't want that to be an additional barrier on top of all the other housing barriers that people are encountering. Another aspect will be to deepen our direct assistance with educational pursuits and professional development. And uh, what we're thinking of is, is really practically developing a fund so that we can um, sponsor uh, our returning citizens, you know, with specific training um, that will allow them to, again, I, I know that I, that we've discussed landing, you know, jobs in the tech industry or a path to entrepreneurship, but beyond that, beyond tech jobs, um, really um, supporting them with what they are passionate about or what they're trying to pursue uh, professionally to the best of our abilities. And, and, and thus far, our, our funds um, are relatively limited um, in our assistance uh, with regards to education. Right. Um, we also are constantly trying to learn. Um, I said at the top of this, I was joking about wearing this raincoat uh, and being in a small nonprofit with a leaky roof. I mean, we do have limited resources. And so with those resources, we want to be efficient. And in our view, one of the best ways to be efficient with our resources is to proactively ask and very deeply listen to the experiences that people come into our programs and the colleagues of ours who are working in these programs so that we can continue to iterate and improve on whatever we're doing. And so that can be anything from literally the way our staff are engaging with uh, the people in our programs, the language they're using, the times and ways that they're communicating with them, the ways that they're helping them to case plan and set goals for the future. And so some of those soft skills, interpersonal type of stuff, even to more concrete things in terms of what curriculum we're using in the different group settings we're doing, where we're hosting different events, how we're engaging with um, clients even uh, after they've graduated from our programming and continuing to try to work with them as alumni from our program. All of the feedback that we gain from that or specific projects like the Guaranteed in Income Project that I mentioned earlier have been really key to us to, again, doing more with less. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, and um, okay, there is another aspect, um, another aspiration for the future that we're very um, excited about, which is to expand our training and consultant services to other agencies, uh, given that we've been doing this work and we've um, for over 25 years, as, as Kyle mentioned, um, and we've innovated in, in many ways, uh, we would be happy to you know, support other agencies that are trying to implement some of the some of the solutions and systems that we've developed throughout the years. And lastly, I, I mentioned this briefly before, but 
as much investment as we and others can make in prevention and front end um, work is is going to be the most successful for all of us. We're luckily to lucky to be able to see that on the ground in our organization since we both have front and back end programming. And so we can compare notes in a very little way, but it's important for us to be able to invest in those preventative services because we see how much harm occurs and is re reciprocated and uh, continues in our community. And for those of us who have been really involved with the systems here in the Bay Area, we know that our best bet was to never be involved in the first place. And so if we can make sure that more and more of our clients and our staff and whoever else are having minimal system involvement, but still finding ways to not just avoid mistakes because people make mistakes, including really big harmful mistakes, but spending a lot more time figuring out what are other ways we can address accountability. And for those of you who have accountability practices in your own lives and your own families or relationships, you know that you can't really hold people accountable unless you have a relationship with them in the first place. And without preaching too much about society, there's plenty of discord and disconnect that all of us really have at times. And you walk down the street and you think that's a stranger. I got nothing to do with that person. But at the end of the day, it's not really, right? We're all living in these communities. It doesn't matter if I know someone walking down the street or not. We still have this connection. And when you start to make that shift, and that's the shift we try to have many of our staff and clients make, it starts to make you rethink the decisions you make, or at the very least, have a different perspective after you've made certain decisions and when you want to make new ones to help repair harm and hold yourself accountable. Um, in any case, we hope that we can do more of that before people have gotten too entangled into justice systems to begin with. That concludes our presentation today. Uh, I know that there's a Q&A session here at the end, so we'll answer some questions and um, feel free to reach out. I think Layla might have put our, our info somewhere so you can reach out to us. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you to all of our presenters, not just for the most recent, very interesting present, uh, set of presentations, but also all day and to everybody who has been attending. Um, as you already know, but I'd like to uh, remind everybody, if you have questions for any of the speakers on this last panel, please put it in the Q&A pod. Um, there aren't any there right now, so we're, we certainly are more than happy and ready to uh, entertain your questions. Um, Earlier, there was a question if, if someone wanted to reach out to any of the presenters, how might they do that? And so kindly everyone um, put, their, put their contact information in the chat. So if you're looking how to reach out to any of them, please check the chat and you'll be able to get their uh, email address to reach out to them. Okay, we have um, a question from Heather. Uh, how, are you, how are you funding your guaranteed income programs? Our guaranteed income program has been funded two different ways, the, uh, the last two cohorts. So we had a pilot cohort funded by the East Bay Community Foundation, which is a private foundation here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then our second and newest cohort that was launched a few months ago has been founded, funded by a, a different private foundation. Okay. Those, those private foundations rely on private donors, just, just to clarify. Okay. Um, another question for Community Works. Do you all work with kids younger than 16? We do uh, in a few different capacities. So the diversion program I mentioned before includes uh, people who are minors. And so young people here in the Bay Area who are minors who are getting into what would be felony level trouble in any of the three counties I mentioned before are coming to us after they've been arrested, but being referred to us by police departments or district attorney's offices so we can work with them to help repair the harm and make amends to whoever they hurt through the commission of different acts um, without going through traditional prosecutorial processes. In addition, we have a program for, again, minors or people under the age of 16 that's specific for children and incarcerated parents. Uh, and so that is actually a job. It's, it's unlike some other programs because it is literally a job. So we're hiring young people uh, to be able to work with their peers to spread awareness and combat stigma around what it means to have one or both of your parents incarcerated. Um, and so that also serves people in that age range. Thank you for that response. Any other questions before we move on to the, um, the final part of the, the webinar? Not seeing any. If any come up while uh, I'm talking, please put them into the, the um, Q&A pod. We can get to them. Lisa, do you mind if I uh, add one more thing? I no, saw go right ahead. Earlier that I've lost. I'm having trouble going between the chat and the Q&A. Yeah, me on. too. <laughs> I saw a question from um, one of our attendees today, uh, or, or really a comment that I think is worth addressing just around the use of TAY as an acronym or transitional age youth. 
Um, and I don't really have a whole lot to say, except mostly agree with you. And I'm constantly trying to figure out the best way for us to be descriptive about people we're working with while also focusing on the people part, right? That like a person is a person and not trying to uh, minimize people down to descriptors, whatever those might be. I uh, don't have a perfect answer for it. And I don't know if you're posing it as a question, but I think it's a, it's a good thing to continuously bring up and challenge all of us on. Thank you for that, Kyle. Any other comments or questions before um, I go through the instructions on how to get the materials that you might um, seek from this, this presentation? Okay, so um, if this is not your first time on a webinar today, then you already know how to do this, but I'll, I'll re remind you anyway. Um, so you can download the uh, certificate of attendance. Um, just as a reminder, it's for your personal po portfolio. It is not uh, for CEUs. This is indicated on the slide here. And um, there's a, Ashley is sharing a file in the chat for that. You'll also see our last poll uh, for the panel popping up as well. We'd be grateful if you would respond to that. It helps us plan our work at the Gain Center as we plan um, next steps for not only in the, within this topic, but other topics that we cover at the Gain Center. So if you'd please um, um, respond to that, we would be grateful. If you haven't signed up for the Gains Listserv, uh, that, that uh, the, um, the QR code and the uh, the link to that are right here on this slide. So if you would like to sign up for the listserv, please do that. A lot of different information is pushed out through our listserv, including solicitations, um, opportunities for technical assistance, other webinars that we and our partners are, um, are in, involved in and topics that are probably of interest to you. So please sign up for the, the uh, listserv and um, I think you'll find it very useful for you in your work. And let's see, I think the last slide is to, are, um, to thank you for your participation today. Um, it, we are really happy to be able to bring this summit to you and they're um, really happy with the turnout and the participation and the questions. If you have some questions uh, that arise after the summit is over, after this webinar is over, you can see at the bottom of this slide is the, is the Gaines Center website and as well as our 800 number that you can call for some assistance over the phone. So we try to be respond to all of our emails that we get with questions and um, would ha be happy to do that. So please reach out to us if you have any questions. And if there aren't any, um, I wanna thank you for your attendance and attention today and all the work that our presenters put into their, their presentations and the work that they do in their communities. And I wanna thank you and I hope you have a good afternoon.